please remain standing for the reading from the Gospel. Today's parable is taken from the 20th chapter of Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received a denarius. And when they now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. In her collection of poetry called The Awful Rowing Toward God, Anne Sexton examines her faith like someone in a canoe rowing against the stream of life, encountering hazards along the way, and finally docking at the island of God's home. The concluding poem in the book is called The Rowing Indeth. In it, she sees herself called by God's great laughter to join God for a game of poker. When the cards are dealt, she is surprised and thrilled. She has a royal straight flush. Finally, she'll win for herself whatever prizes are on the table. In great excitement, she slaps down her cards, claiming winnings. Nothing can beat this hand. But God only laughs, a great, rolling, joyful exuberance that energizes everything around. In rich, good humor, with no malice at all, God throws down God's cards. Five aces. Five aces. That's impossible. But there it is. Sexton writes, a wild card had been announced, but being in such a state, I had not heard it. I wonder how many wild cards God announces each day in our lives, cards that are right before us and in play, but we don't even know it because we are in such a state such a state of anger or dismay at injustice, such a state of grief because of loss, such a state of greed because of success, such a state of apathy because of burnout, 
such a state of fear because you name it, of inflation or war, denied rights, impending disease or diagnosis. I don't know what your such a state is, but I know you have one. In such a state, Jesus' parable invites us to listen again for the good news that there are wild cards to be played. Cards that completely change how we play the game of life all together. In spite of our good fortunes or savvy playing skills or sheer hard work, we never really win when we play the game of life by our own rules. But God is always bending our rules toward grace. What if God's generosity truly knows no limits? What if what we say about God's grace, that there's nothing we can do to deserve it or earn it, what if that is actually true? And what if we lived as if that were true? I wonder then if we might just know a bit more about the true taste of freedom that we celebrate this weekend. A freedom not dictated in the Declaration of Independence for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as wonderful as that is, but a freedom that is born of faith and imaginative dreaming of what could be, rather than prescribed out of an experience of fear of what has been. July 4th celebrates our independence from a country that we felt was oppressing us, constraining us, not treating us fairly. <clears throat> but simultaneously, that celebration of freedom came at the cost of taking away freedom and land from indigenous peoples and enslaving Africans. All to build the country we now called America. And we cannot change the foundation of fear and oppression on which we built this country's freedom, but we can at least acknowledge it. And we could prioritize the liberation of those we deemed the least at our founding as a means of healing for our future. Whenever freedom is bound up in our fear, it's false. It can only carry us so far. But what happens when freedom is born of faith? Faith in a God who does not declare us independent from one another, but who calls us to be dependent on each other, to be co-creators of the kingdom of God, heaven here on earth. True freedom must always be rooted in the foundation that there is room enough for everybody and that life is not a competition for currency, but a community of care. It is not individual success that makes God laugh with celebration, but rather systems where rules are changed for everyone, where wild cards are expected and everybody wins because winning simply means celebrating each other, not competing against each other. Now, if that sounds a bit too Jesus-y, a bit too gospel-y for you, well, welcome to the parables. They turn our lives upside down. We are living in a world that's very prescribed. There are four aces in a deck, and we are thinking that once those aces are in somebody else's hand, then all of the aces are gone, and they can't be in our hand. But what if there are five aces? Or what if God's hand is actually the hand God is trying to give all of us to hold? What if we all have five aces in our hands and we don't even know it? What if God's generosity is just so crazy that if we believed it and lived it, we could actually bring the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven? 
You see, Jesus' parables, they often feel warm and fuzzy to us the first time we read them. They pull at our heartstrings. But if we really listen to their message, it's not our heartstrings that Jesus is pulling at. It's our purse strings. Because money, wealth, and material possessions, these are the things that can keep us away from our hearts. It's why Jesus talked more about money than anything else in the Gospels. Then and now, we measure our worth by the money we make or don't make, by what we have or don't have. And if you're saying, oh, Pastor Ann, I don't do that, well, good on you. And even if you don't do that, our society does. There's no way around it. Money talks, and we might as well listen but not to the money, to the meaning that we allow it to give our life. We allow money to have so much power. And I know why, because money and its corresponding power is the currency by which we know how to be in relationship with each other. It's what we've been taught from the beginning. But when we let money be the thing that gives our life meaning, then we're always going to be seeking more, not just of the money itself, but of the worth that we attach to it. And we'll always be wary of others if, if we think that they might be getting a, a hand out instead of a hand up, or if they might be getting more than they deserve, because if so, that is not fair. <laughs> And we'll throw out our whole system of exchanging the worth of people for the productivity of their work. But do you see this cycle that we can get caught in? It's the same cycle that Jesus' disciples struggled with. The context of our parable in Matthew's Gospel is illuminating. Jesus tells this story right after Peter demands, Jesus, we've left you and we've left everything that we have to follow you. We leave you and then we come back to you. We're here and what's in it for us? And then just before the mother of James and John requests special privileges for her sons. Can one sit on your right and can one sit on your left? You know, these two who have really, quote, borne burdens of the day by joining you in ministry, Jesus. So you see this parable nestled in between these exchanges. It is rightly kind of a rebuke to the disciples who still think that the Messiah's kingdom, the new kingdom that's coming, will come with money, glory, and power. But that is not how this parable describes the kingdom of heaven, is it? In this parable, we learn two key things. Life in the kingdom is not about individual fairness, how hard or long we work. And life in the kingdom is about God's generosity and God's continual invitation to us and God's inclusion of all of us. Now, almost all commentators invite us to read this parable as if the landowner is God. So I'm going to do that today as I preach, and there are other interpretations out there, but I'm just claiming that as my angle today. Because if we read it with this lens, then we learn, yes, God is not fair, but God is just and God is generous. And think about it. Wouldn't you really prefer to have a just and generous God than a fair God? A fair God would be like a judge, evaluating us based on our deeds and good behavior and worthiness. That's the God that many of us grew up learning to please, but that's not a God that Jesus recognizes or invites us to meet. In our story today, a denarius is a day's wage. Scholars say it would have probably paid for three to six days of food for a family. It was a good wage, more than sufficient salary. Their needs are met, God is just, regardless of how long they worked. God is generous. 
And trust me, I know what you are thinking. <laughs> this is not fair to those who were out in the heat for 12 hours of labor, hot and sweaty in the vineyard, and then those who showed up one hour before closing time, they get the same. But can we remove ourselves from our world enough to think not of the world we live in, but rather the kingdom of God that we imagine? Our world and the ways of our world are not the kingdom of God. Use your imaginations, dream of a different system. Think about a world where everybody receives what they need. Jesus is not talking about American economics here. He's talking about the commonwealth of heaven. Jesus is not talking about what an individual deserves or doesn't deserve, which is how we view the world, but rather Jesus is talking about the ideal of how a community lives together and cares for one another. It's almost as if Jesus is dismissing our transactional way of life and inviting us into transformation together. A transformation where all members of the community are valued and essential, not because of what they do, but just because of who they are. Why else would the landowner keep returning to the marketplace again and again? The text never actually says that he needs more laborers, that it's such a big crop that he needs more people to work. He just keeps seeking out laborers because he thinks there might be more people who want to work, who want to be part of the kingdom. So he keeps returning all throughout the day, which is very abnormal behavior. Think about it. If you're the employer and you have a task before you, you know about how much time it will take, about how many employees you need. You would hire them, get them, pay them for their work, but this landowner gets the people he needs and then continues to go out to the marketplace even when the workday is literally over. That should be our first clue that it's really not about the work the landowner needs done, but the laborers that the landowner wants to invite into his purpose and his project and how he wants them to see their place and their purpose in the context of others around them. Nadia Bowles Weber writes, what makes this kingdom of God is not the worthiness or the piety or the social justiceiness of the hard work of the laborers. None of that really matters in this story. It's the fact that the landowner couldn't manage to keep out of the marketplace. He goes back and back back interrupting lives coming to get people grace tapping us on the shoulder in the end she says our calling and our value in the kingdom of god comes not from the approval of other workers or how long we've been there but by us having been come and gotten by god friends it is the pure and unfathomable mercy of a God that defines us not by the pay we are given, but by the attention we are paid by this God. A God who loves us so much that God seeks us out. And when we're not around at 5 a.m., comes back at 9 a.m. And when we're not around at 9 a.m., comes back at noon, and then 3 p.m., and then 5 p.m. We have all been come and gotten by God. So we don't need to look at each other trying to decide whether you've been here longer than me or I've been here longer than you or who deserves what. I mean, all of that is about our control and our reason and rationale, but that's not what's at play here. God's generosity throws reason and rationale out the window. And I know that's unsettling to us, but can you imagine a world where generosity is that abundant? The punchline of the parable says it all. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Hmm. 
How many of you get envious when you see others receiving something good? It probably happens without you even knowing it. You know, what scandalizes the workers who arrived early to the vineyard is not that they got paid what was agreed upon. I mean, if Jesus had called them first and paid them, they would have been on their way and not even known what the people at 5 p.m. got paid. But it's because they found out that those people got paid that they got so upset. It's funny how something so good can all of a sudden seem like less simply because it's shared. It's a universal reaction. I think it's something, if we're honest, that we can all see in ourselves. We think that the miracle in this parable is that the late co-workers get to share in the reward. But what if the miracle is that any of us get to share in the work of the kingdom of God at all? What if the miracle is that God is coming to the marketplace asking us to be engaged in the work of the kingdom of God? That it's not about what we deserve or don't deserve, what's fair or unfair, what we earn or don't earn, but the fact that we're invited to show up and participate. Imagine if the parable went like this. The kingdom of heaven is like laborers who celebrate simply because they get to work in and for the kingdom without worrying about how long or for how much. The kingdom of heaven is like people who are satiated and satisfied by the amazing grace and generosity they receive from God day after day and who see and celebrate that grace and generosity in others too. In the kingdom of heaven, there are no comparison games. No, he doesn't deserve it, or I worked harder than her. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no scarcity thinking. No, if he gets paid more, then I get paid less. No, if they get picked for a job, then I won't have a job. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no jealousy. No, her product is better than mine. Or, no, mm, she's giving him more attention than me. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no questioning of motives. No, they don't even belong here. He doesn't even need the money. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no ranking of privilege or place. No, I was here before she was. Or no, they don't even know what it took for me to get here. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no grumbling about why someone else's table is getting served before ours or why somebody else's family seems more together than ours. There are no if-onlys or what-ifs or how-comes in the kingdom of God. Jesus' parable puts a hard stop to all of that kind of talk, which is to say a hard stop to our culture that promises results from the formula of, if you do this, then you will get that. Friends, if you're living by that formula, you will be disappointed again and again and again. It may be the formula of our forefathers, the formula of our American dream, not just of us here in America, but of people throughout the world, but it is not the formula of our faith. It's not what will transform us. Our faith does not promise us fairness by American standards, but our faith promises us faithfulness from God. And I wonder today, when will God's faithfulness and generosity be enough? This requires us to center the experience of others, even when all we can see is what's going on in our own lives. I invite you today to think of the landowner, how he saw the world not through his own eyes, but how he saw the world through the needs of the laborers who wanted a job, needed a place to work who he kept inviting to come to the fields. If we see ourselves instead 
as the ones in the field, arguing over how much we get paid for how long we've worked, we're just going to continue to live in this comparison world. The crux of our human condition is that we're constantly comparing ourselves to others. And I think it's because we don't truly realize that God does not compare us to others. God sees us and loves us for who we are. We don't have to earn our place in God's presence. We don't have to earn our place in God's presence. Nancy Rockwell writes, the kingdom requires us to give up some of our cherished values, even some of our long-standing opinions, in order to enter the presence of God. The kingdom is a place where we have to do the difficult work of making room for people whose experience isn't like ours, but who are just exactly the people we need in our lives. Only we can't see it at first, and only see it at last. Parables expose and disclose the many ways we settle for a version of the kingdom of God that's nowhere close to what Jesus promised. But we don't have to. Maybe what we could not see at first, we will still see at last. So look again at the deck of cards you've been dealt. There might be an extra ace in there. Amen.